Hello, I didn't get down here. Um, sorry, my doodle is looking at me significantly. I didn't get down here last night because my back is in such freaking pain um, because I tweaked it. But as a, I also got to read uh, lots of... Um, oh my god. That's what I did not look up was, was her name. I didn't look up the name of the author of Sometimes You Have to Lie, the, uh, the, uh, the Sometimes You Have to Lie, The Life and Times of Louise Fitzhugh, renegade author of Harriet the Spy by Leslie Brody, which was just released on December the 1st, and oh joy, my back went into complete horrible spasms, so that's what I did when I wasn't uh, getting up, walking around, and then having to sit down for 15 minutes, then get up again. 15 and get up and down again and unfortunately I also had to call in for sick today so I'm probably going to read more so let me just get you up to speed with the first five chapters of sometimes you have to lie now first thing I did well no actually not first thing I did I read the first bit of sometimes you have to lie which kind of outlines uh, her parents horrible disastrous marriage which uh, what which resulted in a vicious very public uh, uh, divorce, which um, for for uh, biographical reasons is great because she um, Brody Leslie Brody uses the court transcripts to uh, fill up the first part of the uh, of of this autobio of this this biography. It's one of these books where um, usually the start of, of uh, somebody's life you don't know much. You just know oh, okay the parents did this they were from here that this one has a has a complete uh, trial of of um, father basically uh, suing the mother for cruel and unusual uh, treatment. Uh, first, apparently in uh, Tennessee, Memphis, in, in Tennessee, in Tennessee court court uh, justice, uh, where the husband is suing, and it seemed like it was a fairly uh, they weren't happy together, and they shouldn't have got married, but. Uh, he seems to have been a real piece of work, a, um, a um, very hot-tempered, uh, blowhard, um, controlling asshole, <laughs> um, which she shouldn't have married. She sh should not have married. She should have, unfortunately, you get the sense that she should have, she, she really had the clues, but probably that train had started already, and, you know, as such as the mores of the time, she just ended up going ahead with a marriage to this millionaire lawyer a very powerful family, which then had lots of money to uh, sue her and uh, make sure that she uh, lost her case, didn't get any alimony, and lost custody of um, little Louise, uh, and was taken into taken into the family. Seems like mostly raised by uh, the grandmother, who uh, at least as a grandmother to her her little her daughter her grand her granddaughter was actually uh, nice, but. Um, so the first thing I did after I kind of read this section was just like, oh, I should be a good nonfiction reader for a change and go to the back and look at the sources. And it opens with a thing of saying that Louise Fitzhugh hated to write letters. Uh, and uh, so you don't have uh, a lot of, I, I have a sense we're not going to have a lot of Louise Fitzhugh's um, own thoughts. Uh, in this book, where you know we're not going to have her letters documenting what she was thinking about stuff. You know, it's one of these books where the the authors had to had to, had to make up a certain amount of um, speculation to to batch the book together. There's a lot of perhapses uh, even at this point, uh, might haves, would have uh, those kind of phrases. Which I mean, I guess it's the it's the stock and trade of of, of biography and sometimes even history of like um, you have to kind of piece things together to make a story but just being aware that she is making the story uh, there's a we, we get a thing in here of say, of actually to her credit we get a thing in here of saying uh, we're in, in, uh, let's, let's pause for a second okay sorry that's how my doodle talks to uh, the cat who's a, who's on the fence, who's on the other side of that fence over there. Is she sits and she makes horrible growl sounds, if you can see. She's up there now staring over longingly at her little furry frenemy 
who she loves to growl at. Um, but yes, to, her, to uh, Leslie Brody's um, credit, there is a, a thing floated by an earlier biographer that um, that she, Louise was already uh, dating, starting to date girls in high school. I mean, this this uh, chapter five brings us up to about her at sixteen, and uh, but the story the story goes from a single source uh, that uh, she and the girl were dating, but it was discovered, it was hushed up, and that girl was expelled. Um, and Leslie Brody's like, yes, but. Nobody else growing up with her at the time seems to have known of the story. And there's like 31 students in the class and they can't, in, the, in, the, in, her, in her, her school class that, she, that this could have been. And we can't really find any independent, uh, re, any independent uh, sources for this. So maybe take it with a grain of salt. <laughs> Um, which, you know, I, I, I take that as hopefully a good, good thing going forward for this book. Um, we, um, Leslie Brody definitely does a good job of kind of, of, uh, of painting the, uh, picture of Memphis going from, uh, when Louise was born in like 1928, uh, through to, you know, it's the Great Depression, it's, uh, the racism, it's the, it's the sexism of the time. It's uh, World War II. Um, this takes, when she's 16, we're, we're up into the 40s, and the war has just ended, uh, and her favorite uncle, Peter Taylor, has come back, um, who seems to be, who is where Leslie Brody does seem to take that as kind of an indication of of Louise Fitzhugh is going to be, uh, is, is even at this point, she, she, she says, must have been a progressive seeing the racism and racism and sexism of the, of the time because uh, she had this favorite uncle Peter Taylor who had who had those views that was uh, he apparently was good at kind of dissecting society uh, in his in his stories uh, of the time um, now I guess we'll have to see whether that's you know is this is this uh, a author kind of assigning progressive views to their hero uh, their their subject, or is will this get borne out later? I don't know. We'll see. I mean, as a kid growing up uh, in my hometown, uh, I was pretty blind to uh, to uh, the racism and sexism of 1980s uh, Canada in little in a little town. Um, so um, th I don't know if that's wishful thinking on uh, Leslie Brody's part, or it's the fact that Louise Fitzhugh. Uh, is Louise Fitzhugh and you know the, going to be the great author? Going to be a kind of a great author, a great sharp person. And I was just some some smuck growing up in small town Canada. We shall see. Um, so yeah, I'm doing that. I've I've also uh, bought a e book copy of Harriet the Spy itself, and I've decided to kind of read this along as we go along because I know that. Leslie Brody will probably bring her own interpretation to Harriet the Spy, and I've got my own, you know, it's a childhood, a favorite of my own, and I have my own thoughts of it, so I'd like to kind of overlay that with my reactions to it now as an adult, um, and my own, my own perspective, and not just have uh, Leslie Brody, uh, kind of put her perspective on it and me not think about it. There's been a bit at the beginning of, you know, we've of, of talking about Harriet the Spy as uh, a feminist classic, as maybe uh, something of a kind of a, of a queer author uh, view of society. Um, and I can remember as my own view growing up as a nerdy, bookish uh, kid with writerly aspirations, is like, I saw Harriet the Spy as me, as somebody who liked to write things down um, obsessively you know, that kind of thing. So I've got my own kind of, you know, little boy perspective of it. I want to overlay that with my hopefully slightly more mature uh, adult male perspective reading Harriet the Spy as we go along with all of the original uh, um, illustrations by Le uh, Louise Fitzhugh that are dotted throughout the book, which is kind of cool. So yeah, that's the uh, first, first, uh, 
five chapters of Sometimes You Have to Lie, which, hey, we've already had the roll credits moment, which, if you know that from kind of movie criticism, is where someone they saw, someone in the movie says the title of the movie. Uh, Leslie Brody at, says in here, it's like, well, when you were growing up in Memphis, you know, at 16, and you were queer, it's like, you know, sometimes, you know, and, and, and appearance was the most important thing. It's like, sometimes you have to lie. So... Um, that you're going to kind of title the book sometimes you're going to have sometimes you have to lie is definitely probably is definitely you get the sense that uh, Brody is going to frame this book as uh, as a queer as a uh, uh, lesbian woman uh, growing up in a very homophobic sexist time uh, and sometimes she had to lie to get to to live to live and uh, you know, are you? Part of me wonders if the whole reason why there's a dearth of uh, documentation for Louise Fitzhugh is the fact that, you know, if you're a gay person growing up uh, in these times, you keep your head down, you don't leave documentation for sure. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how that gets handled throughout the throughout this biography. It's like how much information is there uh, to be able to construct a life, or will there have to be? so much uh, speculation that it'll it'll sort of be more of an act of imagination than it will be of uh, rigorous uh, biographical documentation or will it be a combination of them we'll, we'll see um, yeah and yeah I have started uh, uh, Harriet the spy and uh, they start off playing town where they, cr they, they cr where it's it's a game where you create uh, a whole bunch of characters um, to populate a town and then you start telling a story and uh you know harriet is trying to teach sport this and sport you know he's like really not that interested but they start telling a story and it's like oh that's cool this is like a little writer little writer and that's so much fun and then we have harriet uh, traveling along in the subway uh making incredibly um make detailing people that she sees in the subway and it's like you know i bet that i bet that uh that uh, fat boy uh, is sad and cries a lot and oh I bet that cross-eyed woman looks at herself in the mirror uh, and and uh, is sad it's like so that's two two pe two people that she's kind of projected maybe her own sadness on uh, but also has very kind of cutting not you know you can tell that maybe she's not very kind Harriet's not very kind about herself and that kind of translates to maybe not being too terribly kind or having uh, and as open openness to the people that she's observing and uh, dissecting in that kind of writerly savage I'm gonna pin you to the board kind of way so uh, yeah Harriet the Spy still seems to have it in, in this very first opening bit of chapter one yeah yeah so that's my check-in for Harriet the Spy as well as sometimes you have to lie uh, by Leslie Brody more videos later